Well, if this is an end-of-term report, we have two of the senior prefects in to look at what lies uh, behind, ahead, and hopefully what lies beneath certain moves. Uh, Chris Thomas, Policy and Reform. Uh, very good afternoon to good you. Good afternoon. And David Ashford, who for some months has been in his job as health minister, but still seems remarkably cheerful and chipper <laughs> after all that. Congratulations. Can I just uh, mention a couple of things? Uh, congratulations to two people who have now entered the world of politics. George Monk, a retired company secretary. This is a the Ramsey's two wards, the commissioner who's uh, been elected to the town's north ward and in the south ward, principal youth officer Nigel Peter Howard, uh, who's uh, going to stand until 2020 uh, as well. Yes, 2020, both of them. Well done, gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the wonderful world of politics. And uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, just just talking about the job uh, as an MHK, and it was quite interesting which one MHK who has had a, comp a prominent role in the last um, few months, has decided to step back from doing his day job, if I can put it that way. And I'm talking about Ramsey's Dr. Alex Allenson. He will continue to practice medicine as a locum GP, uh, but he says the decision to quit two jobs at once was really his. David Ashford, do you think it's possible in the, the modern government in the Isle of Man to actually have two jobs? Well, of course, the thing that Alex had taken on the role was the role I formerly had in the Cabinet Office before I became Minister for Health and Social Care. So I do sympathise with him because it is quite a wide-ranging role that he's taken on there with the digital strategy for government and other roles as well. You can be dealing with multiple different issues on a daily basis. And I think he's taken the very sensible approach of what he's done is rather than trying to keep both up, he's looked at it and he's said, I can do it as a locum doctor but I can't dedicate my full time to the patients of Ramsey. And I think that's a very admirable choice. It will have been a difficult one for him because I know how committed Alex is to the service he provides as a doctor, but I think he's probably made the correct choice. It's two sides to this. First of all, he shouldn't have been such a good politician, basically, I suppose, and attracted the eye, the eagle eye of, <laughs> of government. Uh, but also, if you're a doctor and you're talking to people in your surgery, you can probably pick up things, can't you? You, can, you hear things that perhaps you wouldn't normally hear if well, you were an MHK, Chris Thomas. Was well, that illness you're talking about? No, now? no, not that. <laughs> no, I was talking about the way people are feeling, the way people are, are seeing things, etc. It's, it's quite a useful sounding board, I would have thought. Yeah, obviously doctors are at the centre of their community, so, uh, same as pharmacists and uh, others in similar sorts of uh, work environments. But, I mean, what Alex has said is he's still going to operate as a locum. He's just divesting himself of the partnership interests. So, I mean, I think as local MHKs, we are quite lucky on the island that we are a lot closer to the communities than you would be in, say, a jurisdiction the size of the UK. I've got friends who live in the south of England who've been in their their village now for about 20 years and need binoculars who said to they've, see their MP. well they've said they've never they've never met their MP they've never yeah. even seen their MP or heard hide nor hair of them so whereas on the Isle of Man we're a lot more accessible so I think we are closer to the communities than you would find other, elsewhere if I can suggest to you Chris Thomas you are very much a political animal so presumably when you entered politics you wanted to do it 100% yeah, I do uh, have a professional background. I'm a member of two professional institutes, but I let that lapse. I don't have. I could probably get back into to, to those professional bodies and the, that that career. But no, I I did um, more or less become a full time uh, politician. Political animal. Because it's very hard to combine that for any politician mm. with the um, with family life and with other sorts of aspects of uh, regular normal life. And uh, yeah, I, I felt sympathy and empathy with Alex when he was making those decisions because it must have been very tricky to be chair of the MUA and to have roles in government and to be a, a partner of a GP practice. If you're out there, by the way, get your contributions in early because we're going to take them, uh, particularly the texts and the messages, uh, right the way through this programme. We've got two hours to talk to these two gentlemen who are very much uh, in the making and shaping of the government and the economy etc in the island. Um, the Treasury Minister, Alfred Cannon, though, has warned that despite the fact that what seemingly was good news has come through, income tax receipts 21.6 million more than forecast, he says there's still no room for complacency. I suppose you'd expect a Treasury Minister to say that, but he says there are major challenges ahead. Uh, I, something I put it to him when I was speaking to him is that really um, the stuff that's done at the moment, you can understand some people think it is uh, shifting, shifting uh, deck chairs about and there's still this big iceberg waiting for us at the end of the way and until we someone comes up with a definite answer and say this is how we're going to deal with it yes we've got the money or we will have the money people will be a bit nervous won't they? 
Well, I think the, the key thing is that at July's Timwold last week, there was actually a report laid with various options that we can look at. I said in my speech on the public sector pensions, the elephant that's always been in the room is the legacy is that we need to actually meet the legacy payments. Now, the report laid out various options as to how that can be looked at and done. And I've got to say, that is probably one of the first times that Tim Ward has actually had before it a proper options paper on this. So I think in the last year alone, last year, two years, we've moved on massively. Uh, my personal view has always been, I think previous administrations have ducked this challenge and now we're taking it head on and saying, no, we've got to sort this out in the Cut, next five years. You said options, obviously. People are probably saying, well, haven't we got to the stage now where we stop just going for options, 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 and actually say this is the answer? I mean, you're in the department, which I think you described as the big hungry beast, didn't you? So mm. really, a lot of the, the cost of government is coming, 50%, is it something like that, coming out of your department, isn't it? Huge amount of cost in health and social care. And I'm, I'm not going to bore everyone by banging on again about this is why we need to move to a community and integrated model um, because the acute side is what costs the money if you can treat people in the community and deliver exactly the same outcomes then it's an awful lot cheaper but in terms of public sector pensions which is where we started off in this in this debate there's no great uh, you know there's no great magic pill that's going to resolve the issue if there was then i think previous but administrations so would have many seized times. It. isn't it time someone said yes okay this is what we're doing i think it was the canterbury model wasn't it that uh, howard quail went and looked at dealing in the community rather than getting people to come into hospital in terms of health in yes. terms of health yeah. yeah isn't it time that the government actually said yeah this is it we're going to go for it rather than continually floating ideas well in terms of health that's what we are doing we're working that we've got the sir jonathan michael review going on the review will report and will give us uh, give us a direction of travel there's thing there's transformation projects at the moment going on within the department anyway in that regard so we're not standing still we're not all sat back waiting for sir jonathan's review to report and thinking that's going to resolve it there's an awful lot of work going on across the board and the very fact that we have a department of health and social care i'd point out the uk actually copied us previously it was the department of health they've now created department of health and social care because they themselves have recognized that it's only by the two working together that we can actually deliver proper services for the future. Chris Thomas, can I put a question to you? I put to the Treasury Minister. I was asked by someone, I was on holiday recently, uh, and they said, oh, the Isle of Man, I filled them in with the background. They said, well, what's the economy like? And I had to pause a bit. Well, what is our economy like? Are we, is it good? Is it, uh, no, have we got uh, problems? It's healthy, it's stable, it's robust. Last year I had to announce uh, that the economy, had, in terms of GDP, had fallen by 0.09%. But underneath that, the local economy, there were signs that things were beginning to turn around. And for the third year running, the real value of personal income increased slightly. So the economy, in, in one measure, went down. But there are signs in jobs and in unemployment um, and in activity in the local economy that things are beginning to turn around in the right direction we've got trickle up economics beginning to go on and where we need to have activity we've begin to ha we've begun to have activity can i go back to the big point that you asked uh, david about which is the the health strategy and, and pensions so what people have got to hear in all of this is we've got a five-year strategy from 2015 mm -hmm. We've overlaid that, the programme for government, and David, the minister, and his department are reporting honestly that they've got amber in a few things. They're not quite to where they would want to be. We've now got a medium-term financial plan, not just a strategy, and that medium-term financial plan deals with some of the big issues in, um, in health and care. And that links into pensions because um, ultimately public sector pensions are because public servants who provide public service expect them and get them elsewhere. So we've got to tackle issues to do with staff before we can tackle the health and care service so David will agree with me I'm sure that one of the one of the issues we've got to tackle is that as agency staff and bank Most staff definitely. we've got to make sure that the Isle of Man is an attractive hospital in which to work we've got to make sure that mm. the care system is, is, is supplied locally by qualified experienced well motivated people and so therefore we can't solve anything unless we solve everything together and that's why we're in a much better place because we are looking at health and care with the strategy that we're implementing alongside pensions, a long time, a re alongside a real medium-term financial plan, not just a woolly strategy like the last administration you, had. You've got mm. this enormous snagging list from the West Midlands Review people, haven't you, David Ashford? Um, it's the big picture, though, that's important, isn't we it? We have indeed, but in relation to the West Midlands Review, one of the things I think we should make clear is, as far as I'm concerned, the West Midlands was a critical friend. 
That was the reason we brought them in. If they produced eight reports that said everything is marvellous and aren't you doing well, then I think we'd have wasted our time and our money. What West Midlands have done is they've delved into individual sections. But now that we have the eight reports, one thing I'm very keen on as Minister is that we join them all up and have one work stream. So rather than knocking off the individual work streams within each report, we look at it as one comprehensive review of service. And some of the things that West Midlands have pointed out we've already been working on. So, for instance, in the eighth report, some of the things that were identified um, around the ambulance service and so on were already being corrected within the department. It had already been identified internally. But equally, we shouldn't forget that West Midlands also identified an awful lot of good things that we were doing of what they believed were best practice. I uh, met you with really the, wanted criticism of it, did you? Because you wanted to know what are we doing yeah, wrong, really? Of course we did. It's I mean, nice well, that's the point. The of, back, isn't it? Yeah. That, like I say, that's the point of bringing them in. There's yeah. no point in bringing someone in who tells yeah. you where you're going right and ignores where you, they think you're going wrong. Yeah. But I think we do need to emphasise as well there were good things identified, such as the air ambulance service that got an absolute, an absolutely amazing review from West Midlands. I met with the review team between report seven and report eight and the review team that was over um, one doctor who'd come over on several of the review teams actually said to me that he'd seen practice in the Isle of Man that he's taken back to his home hospital and we charge him it. for it <laughs> so no 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 i think uh, i think we thank him for his input <laughs> just, this was um, in the british newspaper the Isle of Man has been labeled a new silicon valley chris thomas uh, the Times of London featured the island as a market intelligence article which reports on the attraction of its technology sector. Do we have that good a technology sector or is this just yeah, them being nice to us? No, no, we have uh, some very successful companies that are creating high value employment, mm. that are creating training opportunities for people, lifestyle opportunities, career opportunities to, uh, to be involved with international businesses based in the Isle of Man and that's got to be the future. Quality of life is at the heart of our turnaround and we've got a successful exporting sector in many areas that's got challenges to do with international standards and so on but now we've got to make sure that the domestic economy and the domestic society is equal to the international facing economy by helping hospitality sectors care sectors retailing sectors to make sure the quality of life here um, gets back to what it used to be like a few years ago you're listening to Present Politics, uh, the last in the season before the summer uh, recess. A couple of members uh, here with me, uh, big hitters in the government, uh, Chris Thomas, policy and reform, and David Ashford, who has that monstrous health department. Uh, and speaking of the summer recess, this has come in from Albert. Now, Albert, and he asked me to say this tongue in cheek, and I'm, I, I will. I, this comes up every time at this time of year. You mentioned Timor members now being on their summer recess. Could you please, please, please say... Quote, the Timbal members have bundled up their buckets and spades and their beach sandals and sunglasses and gone on their summer holidays until October. Uh, you can, if you wish, say this with your tongue in your cheek. I was just talking uh, to David Ashford. Uh, how many days off are you going to have? In the I'm going to be able to get away to the UK for four days and that's it. Other than that, so. my diary's filled every single day between now and October. Well, you're off to Bermuda then, are you? Uh, <laughs> I'm Tom? not. I, we are arranging a family holiday for a, a week at the end of August, but that's tricky because we've got council ministers, so mm. we're just negotiating whether I'm missing two council ministers and then... Um, and then we'll probably go away as well in September for four or five days. And, and during it. those four or five days, will you have your iPhone with you? Will you be checking emails? Oh, the, the iPad is uh, firmly locked in place, I'd say. It is difficult um, to avoid it because you, if you don't, then you come back to hundreds and hundreds yeah, of emails, yeah. don't you, about things that you feel you should know about. <laughs> Funnily enough, I worked it out the other day. Um, since January, when I took over as Minister of Health and Social Care, I receive on average about 150 emails a day of one thing and another so if for instance i left the ipad at home i'd be coming back to an inbox of roughly around about uh, six six hundred emails after four days but you do get people presumably assuming that you're going to take three months off now don't you well i think unfortunately because because it's called recess people assume it's like a school holiday well i think where it was where you so the farmers could bring the crop, crops in didn't they originally it was because there were so many farmers in timbald they, they all had to go off and bring the crops in etc so they were given this time off to go and do well, it well it's the same around the same around the world in different parliaments as well. I mean, for instance, uh, the Houses of Parliament in the UK 
are breaking up for the summer recess, as they call it as well. But I think it's the very fact of the word recess, isn't it? It gives yeah. this this uh, it's sort of indication that that's it. So although the parliamentary sittings end, everything else still carries on. So my ministerial duties as Minister for Health and Social Care, those members who are in departments, and obviously the constituency issues don't go away either. That all continues as normal. It always seems to me that the British Prime Minister has no longer has, has no sooner settled on her beach or something after about 12 hours than a major crisis usually erupts in the UK and she has to fly back again. Chris Thomas, you were adding to that. No, I was just going to say, um, as David said earlier, can you just ask uh, Albert from Sunny Ramsey whether he's actually in Ramsey or whether he's in Mallorca? We'll we'll probably find out in due course. (laughs) Just a subject I mentioned just before uh, the break. uh, And from Ramsey MHK, Alex Allenson himself, of course, a practising GP, up to £2.5 million could be raised in tax revenue from a policy to legalise the production and sale of cannabis on the island. This came up uh, in Timbald uh, this week. Uh, Dr Allenson has asked the Treasury Minister if his department has carried out its own calculations to come up with a potential revenue. Mr Cannon says it hadn't. Dr Allenson then went and provided his own figures. The Institute of Economic Affairs recently David Ashford, it's quite an interesting subject because not only are you raising money, but you're also actually taking a bit of pressure off the police force as well, aren't you? You are indeed to a certain extent, but I think at the moment... I think this is something that needs to be taken in stages and what we are focusing at the moment is medicinal cannabis and also home affairs focusing on decriminalising possession of small amounts. Well cannabis oil is something that's been in the headlines. It is indeed, cannabis oil is very much in the headlines at the moment and the dealing of of certain And that is, there is a paper coming forward hopefully to council and ministers um, dealing with cannabis oils and cannabis um, and other, you can get it in sprays as well, so all the cannabis products so it has gone before the the um, Drug and Alcohol Steering Group and will now be coming forward to Council of Ministers. So you said um, briefly towards the introduction there that you felt the Isle of Man was a bit behind. I think we're actually ahead of where the UK is and saw several other jurisdictions. One of the interesting things with medicinal cannabis, of course, is the UK is one of the biggest manufacturers of medicinal cannabis, yet it's not actually legal for it to be used, which is uh, a, bit, a bit of a conundrum, really. What's, what's your view of recreational use of drugs like cannabis? My personal view at the moment is I think we should be looking at the medicinal use. I think medicinal use it should be available on prescription um, tightly controlled obviously as to what it will be prescribed for and I also think that we should be decriminalising the possession of small amounts I mean one of the things I know that frustrates police officers is that if you stop someone who's got a very small amount of cannabis on them compared to someone who's got some a tree growing out of their trunk, uh, the trunk of their car should we say, um, although Is that where you grow it? I didn't know. Oh, no, goodness knows but, uh, but uh, just as two extreme examples there (laughs) if you had someone with a tree going out of the trunk of their car if they were actually stopped by the police although the sentence will be different when you end up in court the process the police have to follow is exactly the same under the 1976 misuse of drugs act which is clearly nonsensical because you end up criminalizing people for very small amounts of possession I, I must admit, my knowledge of drugs is restricted to, I think I had some hash cookies at Glastonbury one time when I was there, and also when I was oh, in South Africa. Oh, you confess now, John. I am <laughs> confessing, but that's all, well, the, the, I was being fed the ones in South Africa, oh, I didn't yeah, know I was yeah. taking, and all, the, the only effect it had was make me start laughing, I think, um, although I didn't even know I was taking them. Chris, Chris Thomas, uh, are we going towards that direction? Um, well, I th- I'll associate myself uh, with the remarks that David's just made, but and I'll just add in one extra dimension, which is it's quite hard in the Isle of Man, given that our de- given our desire to have open borders with uh, Liverpool and and uh, inside the common mm-hmm. travel area to do things too differently from across. So that's where we are with this sort of thing. We've got to make sure that what we do is roughly in line, otherwise we'll be putting checks in that people don't want to have as checks in as uh, as people come across. Yeah, from we Liverpool. have to be very careful that we don't we we don't uh, by accident end up disrupting our free movement of travel in and out of the UK. I know I've sat in the airport on occasion and the police have arrived with their dog uh, and I've been having a cup of coffee and I've watched with interest to see if any, I can see anyone sidling out. Uh, <laughs> and I suppose if you did actually have it for personal use, even a small amount, there would be some traces of the smell mm. on you and you could find yourself with a sniffer dog taking a very great interest in you as well. So it's, it's a difficult area. Mr Malarkey basically came up with, a, well, no, 
didn't he? I mean, he basically said, no, we're not looking at uh, this. We're not going down that Well, that what, what, Bill, what Bill said is in He's line with... He's the Home Affairs with, Minister, by the way, yeah. if anyone doesn't know. What Bill said was actually in line with what I've just said before, that we're doing it stage by stage. And what we're looking at now is we're looking at the medicinal use of cannabis and the decriminalisation of small amounts. What we're not looking at is wholesale legalisation of cannabis. But this is no time soon, is it? Well, well, no. As I say, there's a paper about ready to go to Council of Ministers in relation to oh, medicinal really? cannabis, yeah. and the consideration of the initial paper, I believe, has already been between before the Drug and Alcohol Steering Group, which Minister Malarkey chairs. That is actually something about this government and this House of Keys, even this Tin World, which is that we are doing a huge amount of social reform. In the past, social reform took decade plus. Now we are actually getting a hold of issues and tackling them in a couple of years, and I hope the public's noticing that. Well, if the uh, public is listening to this and wants uh, to add their contributions, please, all the way through this next hour and a half, you're welcome to. Sorry, I interrupted you there. Well, I was just going to say, I think that in the past, with past administrations, social reform hasn't taken the priority it should. I think it's always played second fid- fiddle to technical reform. And now it's actually getting the prominence it deserves. We just heard uh, Chris Thomas say what the government was doing, uh, blowing the trumpet uh, for, the, for them. But we've got certain people who say that the government is not doing what it should be doing. Mike Vannon's chairman, uh, for instance, Mark Kermode, who says, and we've just had Timwell Day, says Timwell Day has become more about the people representing politicians and politicians representing the people and pointed to declining attendance year on year. And he says his party will not continue to support Timwell Day as it's becoming increasingly irrelevant. Chris Thomas, what, what does Timble Day actually say to the people? It's our national day. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's about people. It's about events. And I, I completely disagree with Mark. This Timble Day has been, been made more relevant in the last three or four years. So let's look at Keltfest. So therefore we've tried to take our international visitors and the Manx people together into a tent to celebrate everything that's good about our culture down the field in the Arboretum. We've got an international uh, event that now goes along Side the fairground, which has given the people who come to the Isle of Man and chosen to be new Manx, as Lawrence Skelly termed them at an Ilium Down lecture a few years ago, a chance to tell us more about their food and uh, let us eat their food and tell us more about their culture and dance. So they're, they're two things that have uh, improved the day. And alongside the day, we do have so much going on in our National Week. This year, for Year of Our Island, we focused in July on Culture Month, and there really was so much going on during National Week around the island. I suppose you will always have some people who say dressing up in top hats and tails uh, and uh, processing up the processional way is, is old-fashioned and uh, other jurisdictions, other organisations are changing. They're becoming more modern. Should we be looking in that direction? We certainly need to make sure that our democracy is modern and functioning and that's why I'm so frustrated at the moment with the uh, with where we are with the functioning of Tinwald Review. We certainly need to work out a better way of doing legislation, primary and secondary. We certainly need to do a better way of doing committee reviews. But Tinwald Hill itself is on the margins of, of that process and we could make small changes and it wouldn't make a great deal of difference. But I see it as being part of the tradition, part of a celebration of our national culture and it's not actually what uh, the debate about Tim Wood is about. McVannin, to be frank, um, should do more to engage with proper Manx politics. There was a, a, a centenary, there was a centenary on this year's Tim Wood Day to do with the general strike. The strike was lifted at three o'clock. I organised with Coach Vannin in the Year of Our Island a special lecture at three o'clock on Tim Wood Day. We invited McVannin, they didn't show. David Ashford, Tim Wood, just quickly, you, is it still relevant? Yeah, I, I think one of the things with the Tim Wood Day ceremony and what's happened with it over the last few years is it's now mixing the traditional with modernity as well. So it's getting a good combination. And I think what Mark's comments there missed is he's focusing all around the politics. It's not just about politics, Tim Wood Day. Tim Wood Day is about the island as a whole, about our culture. And that's where we are now celebrating more. We're getting more culture into Timwell Day. So it's not just about the sitting on the hill and the, uh, and the, and the proclamation of the acts. We're actually, what we're actually doing is we're getting the culture involved. And I know they were upset about where their tent was going to be positioned this year. But I think by not engaging in the process, all they're doing is isolating themselves. And I think they should be engaged. Also, how many parliaments in the world have a direct petitioning process where someone can turn up with a petition and present it directly before the parliament there's not a lot you could count them probably on one hand 
I, I th remember thinking uh, in the last administration, timbers used to go on for quite a long time, that if they always held timber outside on the hill <laughs> all the way through the year, it might speed things up. Perhaps we should move to Baldwin <laughs> once or twice as well and have it in a real traditional tin <laughs> with, with my cynical hat on, I don't think it would speed it up. It just means we get very wet. <laughs> <laughs>